<laughs> well, I got a first hand blow by blow account from my nephew from Lahaina. Um, he's lived there for 10 years. He's an attorney. They had just built a new house, which out there is very expensive. Uh, no telling what this real estate losses are going to be like, but um, he said the fire was moving so fast. There was an offshore hurricane and the winds were blowing as high as 80 miles an hour and the fire was like a blowtorch. Now he got in his car and was going to leave and was bumper to bumper with people being burned alive in their car. So he jumps out of his car and runs for his life. Now he's not a kid, he's 62. Well, maybe to some of us that's a kid. But uh, he said he has never felt his life more threatened ever. And his wife was at a grocery store miles away. So she was fine. His um, office and the car dealerships are on the other side of the island, so those were fine. But we didn't know for days whether his house made it or not, and it was spared. And we prayed together. He said, I've never prayed as much as I have this week. Now, Chad's been to Lahaina, what, 30 something times, right? In fact, that shirt he's wearing is from Lahaina. Um, be a beautiful spot. I was never there. I saw the pictures of, you know, before and then after is just dreadful. So pray for those people. Uh, Romans 8, 28 said some good can come out of this. I think a lot of people's faith may be strengthened because they almost got killed or they know people that were killed. There's a thousand people missing. And I think the death toll is over 90. So, so um, worst tragedy they've had out there, that's for sure. But, got to start on the lighter side here today. Get the endorphins going. These are some random thoughts from Miss Carol Haley <laughs> here in the, in the front row. So, she's got a lot of wisdom packed in there. I don't know if Facebook has ever caused the lame to walk, but it sure has caused the dumb to speak. <laughs> this one I can identify with. Funny thing about getting older, your eyesight starts getting weaker, but your ability to see through people's BS gets much better. <laughs> Albert Einstein said, stay away from negative people like the left. Uh, we we kind of trend the, to the right here a little bit, uh, Mandy. Um, the left always has a problem for every solution. And their famous saying is, never let a good crisis go to waste. Saying have a nice day to someone sounds friendly, but saying enjoy your next 24 hours sounds threatening. <laughs> a woman with a salad walked past me in the restaurant and said, you know, a cow died so you could have that hamburger. So I said, if you weren't eating its food, it might have lived. I'm still trying to comprehend how the phrase take out can mean food, dating, or murder. And as I get older, I understand why roosters just scream to start their day. So, thanks, Miss Haley. Appreciate that. Well, if you take your outline, we're studying the book of Ezra. The Jews have been in captivity for 70 years in Babylon. And Babylon is defeated by the Medo-Persian Empire. Um, today's Iran. 
And the, uh, Cyrus the king sets a decree that the Jews can return to Jerusalem. And the prophets Jeremiah and Ezekiel both prophesied that it would take 70 years in captivity because of their sin. And so they're now allowed to return. Daniel was highly favored by God. And he must have influenced those Medo-Persian kings. And the Lord's kept his word. He's faithful to his children that love him and keep his commandments. Upon the first group's return, there's actually two returns. The priority was restoring worship of the Lord God, Jehovah. And God preserved the temple articles that Nebuchadnezzar had stolen, so those are heading back. Now, Ezra is writing this book. Now, he is a scribe, a meticulous scribe. You know, they said not a jot or tittle of the law could be changed, but he's also a priest. And he's a very talented person. His great-grandfather was Hilkiah, the high priest, who, if you remember, in back when we were studying kings, he is the high priest, in, and it's listed in Second Chronicles chapter 34, verse 14. And when they had brought out the money that was brought into the house of the Lord, Hilkiah, the priest found a book of the law of the Lord God given to Moses. They hadn't been studying it. It was lost. And so Hilkiah finds this and dusts it off. And a revival breaks out in Israel. But that's his great-grandfather. He's very big on the study the scriptures, Ezra is. And he probably wrote Psalm 119, the longest psalm in the Bible. And he is writing this now as a scribe, describing he's not in the first group that goes back. That's led by Zerubbabel. And so he will finally get there after the temple is rebuilt. And then page two, pray for the nation. And this national leader is probably the worst I have seen in my lifetime. This uh, joke about appointing a special counsel now, the same one that cut a sweetheart deal, uh, is a delay tactic. But it's, it's, it's sad when the leadership of a nation can see the blessing evaporating from God. And you can see it all across our nation. God's hand started this nation and it is evaporating at this point. And the scripture, I'm not going to read the whole thing. It's from Hebrews. But continue to pray for the nation because God can change king's heart. Scripture says he raises up kings and he brings them down. And so we got to pray for godly leadership. And then where we are, we're going to study chapters 4 through 6 today. But King Cyrus sent the decree that the people can go back. And the key players, Zerubbabel, Nehemiah, which we'll study his book next, and the high priest, Yeshua, take back 42,360 Jews plus their servants back to Jerusalem. But there's adversaries. Now, in 70 years, <coughs> the Assyrians took over the northern kingdom. And so they have intermarried. Um, they're now called Samaritans. Of course, you know that. Stigma lasted all through the New Testament, too. But they had intermarried, had pagan practices, 
And so when the adversaries of Judah and Benjamin, they're the ones going back to Jerusalem, heard that the descendants of the captivity were going to rebuild this temple, they came to Zerubbabel, the leader, and said, hey man, let's join hands here. Let's all do this together. Well, they were smart enough to know that these Samaritans worship pagan gods, they dabbled in Judaism, but they intermarried, and so they're not going to trust these people. <clears throat> he said, you know, we even sacrifice to your God. But Zerubbabel and Jeshua and the rest of the heads of the house of Israel say, uh-uh, no, you have nothing to do with the rebuilding of this temple you would get involved just to cause problems and we've all worked with people like that that just love to cause problems i was telling uh the woods i was on the building committee for the first prestonwood baptist church down on hillcrest in arapaho and the committee was very positive we knew that church could be a home run. And we had a guy on the committee that every meeting complained. There's no way we'll fill 4,000 seats in this church. There's just no way. We're wasting our money. Let's build a much smaller church. <clears throat> and it caused all kinds of delays. So that's what Zerubbabel is thinking these people are just going to cause problems. Anton, yes. You know what we were talking about last week were with Judah and Benjamin? Yes. If this is saying that some of these were from Assyria, wouldn't that be from the northern kingdom? They were. There was also some of the poor people left. Well, I realized that, but he said specifically that Assyria took them there. So I figured that was when they were captured. Yes, they, they took over the ten tribes of the northern kingdom right. and so but they all kind of so mixed they couldn't, prove their, <coughs> they couldn't yeah. prove their lineage for one thing which was very important to the jews at that time so these folks tried to discourage the people of judah they troubled them in building they hired counselors lawyers against them to frustrate their purposes all the days of King Cyrus all the way to the king reign of King Darius of Persia a period of 18 years now if you've ever built anything you know that there is always going to be holdups um, I could tell you stories when we were building health clubs that um, just would curl your hair I remember the first one. Now the first one's usually the hardest. <coughs> Donna and I purchased a trailer that was 60 feet long, all glass front, that we were gonna use for a pre-sale uh, demonstration unit while we built the health club on Arapahoe Road. So, guy said to me, where do you want this trailer? I said, well, let's put it right on Arapahoe Road right here. This is perfect. People can wave as they go by. And so I hooked up the gas, the electric, uh, the phones, did the printing. And there's a knock at the door of the trailer. And uh, this inspector says, do you have a permit for this thing? I said, well, we're building this club up here. No, he said, for this trailer, do you have a permit? I said, no. He said, well, get it out of here. <laughs> so, you know, things like that can really frustrate. So for 18 years, they had construction delays. Now, not to confuse you, but there were 12 kings of Persia during the Medo-Persian Empire. 12 of them. Now, Cyrus was the first, but there were also three named Darius, Darius one, Darius two, Darius three, and four 
named Artaxerxes, one, two, three, and four. And then there was also Arta, Artaxerxes. So these people got together and started writing these kings complaint letters. And they said, they wrote in Aramaic script because that was the diplomatic language of the day. And they said, listen, you're going to have problems with these people rebuilding the temple. And so they send these letters and the rest of the nations. And the noble, I love this guy's name, Osnapper, Osnapper. <laughs> he was the king of Assyria that took over the northern kingdom. So this is the letter that they sent to the kings of Persia, to Artaxerxes. And it says, Let it be known to the king that the Jews that have come up to us at Jerusalem, they're rebuilding this rebellious and evil city. They're finishing its walls, repairing foundations. Now let it be known to the king that if this city is built and the walls completed, they aren't going to pay you any taxes. They're not going to pay any tribute, no trade customs, and the king's treasury will be diminished. So they're smart. They're telling him it's going to affect his money. So they have his attention. Now, because we receive help from the palace, it's not proper to see the king's dishonor. Therefore, we sent and informed the king and search your records. Take a look at the records of your father. And you'll find in the book that this city is a rebellious city, harmful to kings, harmful to provinces, They've incited sedition in the city in former times until this city was destroyed because they were so rebellious. And we need to tell you, if this city is rebuilt and completed, you're not going to have any dominion beyond the Jordan River. So you're going to lose a big part of your kingdom if you let them finish this. So he has the scribe and the rest of his companions who dwell in Samaria and beyond the river, the letter which he sent to us has clearly been read before me. Okay, so this is the king reading what they sent and getting back to them. And I gave the command and the search has been made and you're right, I found this city has revolted against kings before, primarily because of high taxation and not letting them worship the Lord God, Jehovah. That's why they rebel. And there's been mighty kings in Jerusalem. You know, they had a king named David, a king named Solomon, who ruled over the region beyond the river. And they even collected tax, tribute, and customs to them when they were in power. So we give the command, make these men cease, that the city may not be built until I give further instructions. So he calls his people, they get letters to the, they have like governors, mayors down here, and, we're running things for the Persians. And he says, now take heed, do not fail to do this, or you'll probably lose your head. Why should damage increase to the herd of, these, of our kings of Persia? Then when the copy of King Artaxerxes' letter was read before all these complainers, they ran, they couldn't wait. You know how people, some people, bad news can get it out quicker than good news. Well, they got up there to Jerusalem against the Jews. They brought their weapons and they 
made them cease construction. <coughs> so this thing's taken a long time to build. And the work of the house of God, which is in Jerusalem, ceased. And it was discontinued unto the second year of the reign of Darius, king of Persia. That's Darius the first. Now there was also a Darius of the Mede Empire. It's a common name. What they would usually do is have royal people marry between families. It causes peace treaties. And that's what got Solomon into trouble, by the way, with his 700 wives. If you can imagine that. I mean, one is hard enough to handle. 700. Wait. Now, chapter 5. Then the prophet Haggai, who wrote the book of Haggai, which we'll study soon, and Zechariah, the son of Iddo, prophets, they started preaching up a storm to the folks that pulled off the job. So they're prophesying to all those in Judah and Jerusalem, and they said, Look, in the name of the God of Israel, we need to get this thing rebuilt. So they prophesied and they convinced them. And Zerubbabel and Jeshua rose up and began to go back to work and rebuild the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. And the prophets of God were with them, helping them, encouraging them and I wrote in my Bible what Gary Kinder used to say what the government condones that the Bible condemns go with God go with God so here is the this uh, <coughs> what they call the governor who's running the territory in Jerusalem so he's supposed to be you know, over these people, but they're not listening to them. So at the same time, Pat and I, the governor of the region beyond the river, the Jordan River, and his companions came and spoke to them and said, what do you think you're doing? Who's commanded you to build this temple and finish this wall? Then accordingly, we told them who was in charge the names of the men who were constructing this building. So they named the leaders. And I love this phrase. But the eye of their God was upon the elders of the Jews, so they could not make them cease. God's favor and protection was upon these people. So they wanted to get a report back to the new king Darius and a written answer was returned concerning this matter he had tried to put a finish on this brouhaha and either get him to stop or let him finish <coughs> so they send a letter I don't know how they delivered all this mail I mean you know it's not like there was email it's the Camel Express or something I don't know but they send a letter to him. And it says to Darius the king, peace, all peace. <clears throat> Let it be known. We went to the king and we did what he said. We went to the province of Judea, to the temple of the great God. They recognize him as the great God. They just don't worship him which is being built with heavy stones and timber and this laid in the walls. And hey, this work goes on diligently and they're making progress. It's prospering in their hands. Then we asked those elders and we said thus to them, who told you you could do this? Who told you you could go back to work and rebuild this temple and finish this? We asked their name. So they obviously named Haggai and Zechariah and Zerubbabel that we might write the names of the men who were chief among them. 
But here's what they said. This is such a great reply to the king of Persia. They returned this answer saying, we're the servants of the great God of heaven and earth, just like the way the apostle creed starts. The Lord God Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. And we're rebuilding this temple that was built many years ago, which a great king of Israel built and completed the great king Solomon. But because our fathers provoked the God of heaven. Now, how do you provoke God? I was listening to a sermon this morning. And he said, when you're claiming to be a Christian, in fact, it was Robert Jeffers, you're claiming to be a Christian, but yet you're the one that embezzled money from the company, or you're the one that has lied on his tax return, or you're the one that swindled somebody somewhere, that provokes God. It profanes his name. We're the servants, but because our God Father has provoked the God of heaven, he gave him into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. God will use nations to judge other nations. And he used Babylon to judge Israel for 70 years. And they destroyed the temple and carried away the people to Babylon. However, in the first year of King Cyrus, his first year, first thing he wanted to do, he issued a decree to rebuild this house of God and give them back all the articles of gold and silver. Never mentions the Ark of the Covenant in, the, in this book which Nebuchadnezzar had taken from the temple and carried into Babylon. So King Cyrus took all this stuff and gave it back to us to finish and rebuild our temple. And they were given to one named Sheshbazar. Love the names in the Bible. And he said to them, take these articles, go carry them to the temple, to the house of God, and be rebuilt on its former site. So they want that temple rebuilt just the way it was. Won't be as flashy and beautiful, probably not as much gold, but it's going to be the same size and the same location. And that same Shesh Bazaar came and laid the foundation of the house of God, which is in Jerusalem. But that time from even now, it's been under construction, delay after delay after delay, and it's not finished. Now, therefore, if it seems good to the king, I like the way they ask that. If it's your pleasure, please let a search be made of the king's treasure house in Babylon. Whether it's so that that decree was issued by King Cyrus or not, and let the king send us his pleasure concerning this matter. So they didn't make demands. They just said the fact, and they told him, hey, find the evidence, and we'll do whatever you want. So chapter 6. So King Darius said, all right, I'll go along with you here and I issued a decree and a search was made in the archives where the treasures were stored in Babylon at Achmetha in the palace that is in the province of Media. The reason they stored their documents in this city, 6,000 feet elevation, helps preserve the documents. So that's one of the four capital cities that they had of the Persian kingdom. And they found a scroll. Eureka! We found it. A record was written. In the first year of King Cyrus, he issued a decree concerning the house of God of Jerusalem. He said, let that house be 
rebuild the place where they offered sacrifices and let the foundations be firmly laid. <coughs> its height, 60 cubits, cubits a foot and a half, so the temple's 90 feet high. And 60 cubits wide, it's 90 feet wide. Three rows of heavy stones, rows of timber, and I'll tell you what, we'll pay for it. That's what Cyrus decreed. In fact, there is a whole movement over between underground Iran and Israel called the Cyrus Movement. They want to get rid of the mullahs, well, at least this organization does, and get back to being friendly with Israel. In fact, they had the, um, the, the crown prince of Iran, the Shah's son or nephew, I forget which one, visit Israel and just embrace the whole movement. So we'll see what happens, see what God's got plan there. But he said, return everything that Nebuchadnezzar took. Restore it back to the temple, each to his place, and deposit them in the house of God. So they found the proof. <coughs> and Darius sends this decree. Now this governor of this region, Tadanai, and the Persians, he handled the business for the Persians down there. And he's telling people, hey, leave these people alone now. And let the work of the house of God alone, leave them alone. Let the governor of the Jews and the elders of the Jews rebuild this site. So now they have permission. Moreover, I issue a decree that you'll do all for the elders of the Jews. Let the cost be paid at the king's expense from our taxes and be given immediately to these men so they are not hindered. Whatever they need, you give them. Bulls, rams, lambs for the burnt offerings, wheat, salt, wine, oil, anything the priests want, you give to them. So God's favor has fallen upon these people. And may the God who causes his name to dwell there Destroy any king or people who put their hand to alter it or destroy this house of God, which is in Jerusalem. I, Darius, issue this decree. Let it be done diligently. Or as President Trump used to say, quickly. Do it quickly. And Tatna, the governor of the region, did diligently because when you disobey the king, you don't usually last very long. And it's not to be unemployed, it's to be terminated. And he did according to what King Darius had sent. So the elders of the Jews built, and they worked, and they prospered during the prophesying of Haggai, the prophet, and Zechariah, and they built and finished it according to the commandment of the God of Israel and according to the command of Cyrus, Darius, and Artaxerxes. So it took another 23 years to get everything finished for the temple. Now the temple was finished on the third day of the month of Adar, which is in the sixth year of the reign of King Darius. And the children of Israel, the priests, and the Levites, and the rest of the descendants of the captivity celebrated the dedication of the house of God with great joy. I bet they were just thrilled to have it back. And they offered sacrifices at the dedication of his house. hundred bulls, two hundred rams, four hundred lambs as a sin offering for all Israel, and twelve male goats, according to the number of the tribes of Israel, they haven't forgotten 
the other 10 tribes because some of them are kind of intermingled back here. They assign the priests to the divisions and the Levites to the divisions as it is written in the book of Moses that Ezra's great grandfather had found. And the Passover is celebrated. The descendants of the captivity kept the Passover on the 14th day of the first month. For the priests and Levites had purified themselves. All of them were ritually clean. They've been <coughs> through the mikvah baths and they're ritually clean. And they slaughtered the Passover lambs for all the descendants of the captivity. Remember, most of these people were born in Babylon. Very few lived to come back the whole 70 years, including Daniel. And so the children of Israel who had returned from the captivity, they always eat these sacrifices, typically. I mean, they, they don't let it go to waste. They ate together with all who had separated themselves from the filth of the nations of the land which had drifted back in. These would have been people that worshipped Baal, pagan gods, and they have put it away. They have repented of that, and they were accepted back into the fold. Separated themselves in order to seek the Lord God of Israel. And then they kept the Feast of Unleavened Bread seven days with joy, for the Lord made them joyful. And even turned the heart of the king of Syria towards them to strengthen their hands in the work of the house of the God of Israel. So revival has come back to the land. And it's a great lesson for us today that revival can come back to the land. But only if people will turn toward, back to God. So then what we learn always check the motives when supposed friends want to help with a call. They may be there for ulterior motives. Zerubbabel and Jeshua were smart enough to know <coughs> their adversaries wanted to interfere with the rebuilding. And the lying accusations of those trying to thwart the work are exposed. And King Darius agrees with the edict of King Cyrus. He honored the word of the previous king to allow him to fund the rebuilding project. He also threatens to hang anybody that interferes with the timbers from their own house. So he put the fear of, you know what, into them. And then the years long effort are culminated with a joyous dedication and celebration, the keeping of the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. The Jews remembered God and the laws given to him by Moses. They hadn't lost that while they were in captivity. So they went back to worshiping according to the Mosaic law. Now Ezra doesn't isn't back here yet. But once the temple is finished, there's a second wave of people that come back. And Ezra is going to be part of that group. And, you know, it's probably natural human nature to wait and see if it's going to turn out okay. You know how a lot of people, once it's done, you know, they want to join in. But, uh, so anyway, there's two um, aliyahs back to Jerusalem. So that's our lesson for today. We'll open it up if you have questions, comments, uh, complaints.
Yeah, and they needed the tax money, so they wanted to send them back to work, right? Yes, it was 70 weeks of Daniel, yes. No, I mean, God sees, <laughs> he sees the future from the past. Yeah. There, he, there's he, time he is different. Back. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Good advice. Anybody else? Well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, we're grateful for this lesson from your word because your word is truth. And we can learn so much from what has happened to the nation of Israel. Israel is your time clock, Lord, and we would be wise to watch the events there closely and to pray for the peace in Jerusalem. Father, we pray for these prayer requests today. We know that <coughs> in this world, we're gonna have tribulation. But Jesus, you said to be peace. He has overcome the world. We put our faith and trust in you. We have the redemption of your shed blood. And we thank you for that, that we can spend an eternity with you in paradise. Mm -hmm. I thank you for this ministry. I pray you continue to bless everyone who helps. We just um, love you, Lord. Want to do your will. And we give you all the glory and praise in Christ's holy name. Mm -hmm. Amen. Amen. Mm -hmm. We'll see you next week.